afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. We're, we're, we're going back to the next session now with five companies coming back to uh, pitch their innovative products. Um, as, as is the case with the previous, or was, as was the case with the previous session, we're going to have a 45-minute uh, forum with approximately five minutes per company for pitch and then a few minutes afterwards for investor Q&A. The first company coming in to pitch is Tata Medical, and in the room we have Katerina. Katerina, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. We can we can see your screen. Perfect. So, hi, I'm Katrina, CEO and co-founder of Tarda Medical. Uh, our journey, journey started with an EU-funded innovation program where we spent eight intense months at the Children's Oncology Clinic, clinic to identify their unmet needs. The most frequent invasive procedure is infusion therapy. 3.8 billion tubes are used annually in US and Europe. 10% of these gets accidentally dislodged during use with massive consequences, adding up to 28 billion euros in unnecessary healthcare consumption. So I will show you a movie. Uh, introducing the world's first ever market-ready breakaway connect for IV lines, Tata Medical's WeLink reduces the risk of accidental IV dislodgement. WeLink ensures safer therapies for patients and nurses. Relink promotes accurate dose and avoids spillage. Since it's reconnectable, Relink reduces the time to restart the line and saves valuable bedside nursing time. When we started working with Relink, we saw the need from a lot of different wards and angles. Relink is a platform technology laying the foundation for an entire product family with a wide application in profile in human and animal infusion therapies in both hospital and home care setting. Relink Care. It's market ready. It is designed specifically for gravitational IV and bears the CMARC. A clinical trial is planned for later this year. Relink Advance is created to be used for infusion pumps and IV fluids, including blood and blood products. Here we plan a multi center clinical trial in two European countries with the help of an EU funded program. Relink Closed System is designed as a closed system connector device to protect healthcare professionals' exposure to toxic drugs. Here we plan a clinical study at two university hospitals in Germany. Relink Digital comes with monitoring and communication ability to cater the needs of home care market. Relink VET is designed for, for veterinary market, and we are working in a collaboration with the only animal university hospital in Sweden for this product. The trial is planned for autumn this year. When the problem is that something breaks, the standard solution is to make it stronger. We did the opposite, we made it weaker. The weak link activation, where a link separates into two parts, prevents the catheter from being ripped from the patient in case an accidentally pulled IV line, reducing the consequences. And that's the difference between us and the competitors. The benefits are many, and all of those benefits adding up to making healthcare professionals and patients safer. And that is something our entire team shares the value for, and I'm lucky to have the best team in the world. My co-founder, Rebecca, has a PhD in engineering sciences, and Christopher is a medical doctor specializing in anesthesiology. I'm an engineer with an MBA from Warwick, and the rest of the team is highly qualified as well, some with PhD and some with a background from top-tier consultancy firms such as KPMG and Ernst Young. Several of the team members have also patent granted. Collectively, we have 87, and the team brings together a lot of different experience required to bring a medtech product to the market. Uh, to access the access to hospitals, the trial studies and evaluation has become a lot trickier with the pandemic. And we are proud of our network and that we have been able to secure funding for several studies. We use these as stepping stone to allow Relink to be in more advanced application and create optionality. This approach has caused, caught, um, caught the attention from several larger business to business players, and we're in discussion with several of them. Some sell, some manufacture, and some both sell and manufacture. And those are the different sales stream of possibility and possible collaborations for us. And all of those are interesting discussions that we would love to have with the new investors as well. We would love to welcome investors on board, primarily from Mentech Life Science or Pharma Experience. We are opening around after the summer and we'll be looking for four million euros. One and a half of these we've already found. And the money will be used for increasing the team commercialization as well as manufacturing. Uh, we see exit opportunity after approximately three years with an IPO. 
uh, we would love if you contact us so we can um, go through the milestone and the revenue and all the milestones in a much greater detail. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Katerina. Um, maybe, maybe if I could start off with a question, um, and you, you, firstly, congratulations on the wonderful progress that you've made, both from a regulatory and early commercialization perspective. Um, my question is really, you, you seem like you have a number of, of, of products you can kind of bring um, through, to, through clinical trials and ultimately to market a number of ways you could take those um, products to market, either by out licensing, working with partners or, or, or direct. I'd be very interested in just in terms of the near-term focus, where you, which, which areas you're prioritizing in, 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 in what you run through in the presentation. Um, we, we would like to have licensing deals with larger players because that way we would reach all, all the global hospitals. But I'd, I'd, we call the strategy actively waiting. So we do things at the same time as actually getting there. And we have spoken to quite a few of the larger ones and they don't want to risk their brand name and they want you to prove market. At the same time, the more you are at the clinics, the more you learn. So ideally, we actually want to state in two places in the value chain, both at R&D, need-based product development, but also at the marketing side where you do the evidence-based marketing and actually the clinical trial. So I think it, it's a really good opportunity we have with staying and linger on a little bit more before somebody takes over the technology. Yeah. Thank you. Um, open up for, for questions from the rest of the investor panel. Uh, yes, Chris. So, sorry. First of all, great presentation. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, can you just say a little bit more about the, the traction and, and kind of where you've gotten to and what, uh, yeah, yeah sure, like sure. Now, we, we uh, had meetings long ago with BD, for instance, and they pointed out what what they wanted. We sh shortly had a check checking up with them. Then uh, they are interested, and then we have quite a number of different uh, companies in different streams who, who have shown interest. I would say that we're still too early for BD, and also the first product that we have, the care product, it's for gravitational IV. Uh, the, mar the, margins, the margins there are, are not that great. Whereas if you move up the value chains towards oncology and dialysis and you know you name it, there will be increased uh, interest. But getting there, I, I would say it's it's great. You know, um, spend time with key opinion leaders and, and have some trials and uh, get evidence for what you know. Uh, but but I, I I can you know. <laughs> in a pri more private setting, show you know emails and conversation about the traction. But um, I would say it's great. And at the same time, you don't really want to sign, and, and um, you know you, you you want to know what you're doing when you s sign a uh, a deal with somebody going forward, because that would m mean certain exclusivities, etc. Uh, thanks, Katerina. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Uh, time for one more question, Dan. Hey, Katarina, it's Dan here from Hi. CMS Ventures. Just a quick question. If you talk to clinicians about um, your product, and can you share with us some of the feedback that you've got from them being the end user of your product? Yeah. Now we, we, as, as I mentioned, we started at the Clinical um, Innovation Fellowship where we spent uh, time at the clinic, and we used the Stanford Biodesign to actually come up with the idea through observation. And the nurses and the clinic has stayed with us so we both stay st still in contact with them, but also also reach out to other user groups. The last user intervention we had was um, a few months ago where, when we had, and it's very tricky to get access to the hospital, but the nurses actually came to us. We rented a conference room uh, and had a usability thing due with aspect to the CE market to have that approved. And, um, 94% of the nurses, when they had, were asked if they wanted to add something after our, our, our questionnaire, they asked, when can we buy it? Um, so. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Great. Well, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll say thank you to Dan for that uh, uh, question and Chris as well. And thank you, Katerina, for the excellent presentation and for, uh, for your answers. I think we're going to move over now to our next uh, uh, presentation, which is Choice Telemed. 
Hi, guys. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Um, particularly over the last 12 months of the, the clinical pressures in our hospitals. Um, but it, it's actually been that way a lot for, um, for diagnostics and imaging radiology for the past decade, where the, the volumes of examinations is growing about 11% per annum, and the data within the examinations, you know, the images is actually growing at about 23% per annum. Um, and the number of readers is actually only growing at 2 to 3%. So, um, and then on top of that, um, you've got medical research and clinical trials obligation, which adds, you know, increased pressure again. Um, and in the clinical setting, clinical takes priority, and whereas the pharma companies, do, they just really want to get their work done. Um, and this often, um, you know, the trials work um, generally requires uh, high-end expert specialists. They're quite time consuming, and they generally have a 72-hour turnaround. So there's a lot of friction, a lot of tension, um, and that's where essentially we come in. So what we do is we enable the consultants to work in their own private time um, and then charge the pharma and uh, CRO companies um, for the privilege. So the net effect of what we do is we're freeing up NHS clinical time or healthcare time and we're also in parallel, we're speeding up return for the pharma and CRO companies. Um, and, and so essentially both sides are happy with the outcome. So that's why we're part of the uh, very prestigious uh, NHS clinic, clinical entrepreneur program, enabling um, extra clinical time for the NHS and, um, and speeding up access for pharma and CROs. So thus far we have had really good success. We have over a dozen um, pharma and CRO companies on the books. Uh, we're providing really good service, really good feedback. Um, and not just in trials imaging, also in telehealth. We provide services to the biggest medical emergency company in the world, video consultations globally. Um, and essentially, we're their go-to guys in Europe and MENA region when they need to speak to high-end specialists. Um, and we're starting to see the cross-pollination between telehealth um, into clinical trials imaging as well, which we decentralized trials, etc. So why are we here? Well, we, we've grown considerably in the last 18 months. Um, and I suppose, if anything, we're kind of in uncharted territories. Um, we're, we're not a startup anymore. We're a small company, but we're really enthusiastic and really want to grow to a mid-size and a larger company. Um, our background is really medical. Um, I myself am a former imaging systems lead across all of the Northwest region. Um, and, and my medical director, Dr. Bassett, he's a consultant radiologist, uh, oncology, PET-CT trained, and a Royal College of Radiology Gold Star Award winner. So our, our expertise in growing to the next level um, is, is what we're really looking for. So we've done some amazing work over the last two to three years. Uh, we're 100% privately owned. Uh, we don't have any debt. We were growing organically, um, and we just feel now is the time to um, to to grow, to take that next step in, in the right direction. So we're really looking for an investor or partner who has experience in the life sciences or biotech pharma arena in taking small companies and bringing them to a larger level. We, we, we already have a proven model. We know what we're doing works, you know, based on the revenue and good profit return that we already have. Um, what we want to do now is to scale that up on, 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 on um, to essentially a smaller part of a bigger pie um, and, and use what we already have, uh, the knowledge and expertise that we have. So um, we have over 50 consultants in radiology and 50 in, in non-radiology. Um, and like I say, we, we have great access to the systems to enable telehealth globally. We have some fantastic stories um, and fantastic case studies that we ran all over the world. So um, so in summary, um, if you're that person, if you can bring us to the next level, we have a vision and we can follow what we're doing already for the last three to five years um, and, and, and essentially build, build that up over the next three to five years. But if you can come along and help us and accelerate that, uh, we're probably more interested in, in the dragon than the dragon's gold um, and bring us to that next level, then we'd be really interested in speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Parik. Uh, perhaps uh, you can you just, uh, stop, stop sharing of your screen and we can go back to the best uh, uh, Great. So as, as usual, I'll, I'll maybe open up to a few questions from uh, our panelists. Sure, yeah. Yeah, Dan. 
Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, great presentation. Really system in need, and congratulations on the traction you've got so far, and the clients that you have. Um, my question really revolves around um, of the clients that you've had uh, in the clinical trials. Um, how many of those are repeat customers? And also, um, how do you sort of a double question? So, I'm sorry, everyone else on the panel, but how do you compare with your competitors um, in this space? So, yeah, when, yeah, we we our, our current climate clients, we try to turn them into raving fans, as as, as we call them. Um, so yeah, our, our our clients are continually, you know, once we have an MSA in place, with our clients are constantly coming back to us. Um, I'd say probably Paracel is probably our our biggest client in 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 pharma and zero. And we've been working with them for I think over three years, and we have excellent feedback from them. And then um, international SOS in, in in telemed and telehealth have been you know we've been our client for four or five years. And we've done we started in teleradiology with them, and we've gone all the way to video consultations with them um, in the last eighteen months, twelve eighteen months. So they so some of the projects we've done with them, and some of the projects we're working with them, it's it just absolutely um, you know spectacular. So um, so that's and to your first question. So your second question again was. Uh Product differentiation from your competitors, and congratulations on, on, on your. Yeah, I, I, I suppose in the trials imaging, I don't think there's anybody really doing trials image reading in the UK, similar to us. Um, I actually started working in Clatterbridge Cancer Centre, not too far away from where I'm based, and we actually saw that all the imaging reviews were being done in the US, you know, that the second and third reviews, hence why we set up. So we don't have very many competitors in the UK. They're mainly US-based. Uh, in the telehealth space, then, um, a lot of the providers, like people mentioned doctor, doctor and, and companies like that before, are generally doctor to patient, whereas we're, we're doctor to specialist. So we're, you know, I think there's a niche area there. So when the doctor goes and reviews a patient on a GP app or something and they need access to a consultant cardiologist, a nephrologist, an orthopedic surgeon for a second opinion, that's essentially the area we are. So I think that's a niche area, that's a growth area. There's a lot of GP apps out there, but the, the next level up. Is, is what we provide. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Chris, final question for you. Sure. Just a quick question on on the fundraise. Um, kind of, what does what does that look like, and what's the use of funds? Um, yeah, we, we like I said, we're more interested in the dragon and the expertise to take us to that next level of business development in this area than than um, the dragon. Like we're really looking for you know to invest in business development. Um, we are a service company and we want to develop some IP um, technology in, alongside what we're doing. Um, we're using a lot of bespoke systems knitted together. So we want to sort of build something that into an offering that we can do, but we just don't want to build anything. We want to build something that's really targeted and focused. It is sort of Uber style um, telehealth um, where you can go out to your specialist and they can accept the, um, they were in a much more compact way. So, so business development, we have invested a lot of the money that we've put in, you know, in, in rebranding and we're redoing our website and we've done conferences all over the world and, you know, trying to get out there and get into more companies. So that will be really where we'd look to, like to put the money. Also the investor as well, you know, really well connected in the industry and pharma and, and um, biotech and, you know, be able to leverage upon that as well is really important area for us. Great. I think we'll have to leave it there, Parikh, but appreciate uh, uh, the, the presentation and your great answers to those questions. So thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We're going to invite in the next company to pitch, which is Fenu Test. Hi, uh, Paul. It's Will, Will Weinberg here. I'll share my screen. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, Will. Uh, let me know. Hopefully you can see that. I think it's coming up. Yeah, we can see your, and there's the pitch. Great. Amazing stuff. Wonderful. Well, thank you for um, giving me some time to pitch um, FenuTest to you all. So FenuTest is um, targeted at developing a 30-minute rapid urinary tract infection diagnostic kit. Uh, and my name's Will Weinberg. I'm one of the founders. Um, a very new company, but very excited to talk you through what we've got. So um, urinary tract infections, um, so, something that I think most people will be aware of or most people may have experienced in their lifetime. Um, I wanted to basically talk you through 
kind of an example story and the, the example experience that patients and clinicians have around urinary tract infections and then some facts and figures. So on the left, you can see um, a, a typical experience extracted actually from, from uh, Jim O'Neill's book on, um, on antimicrobial resistance. Um, uh, and the basic story is a patient will present to um, primary care with the symptoms of a urinary tract infection. And the primary clinician won't have a huge number of diagnostic tools available to them. There, there are dipsticks, which are uh, unreliable for people over 65, um, but there are no good diagnostic tests to help the, the, the clinician with, with um, prescribing. Um, so the, um, uh, the clinician will give, um, give the patient a prescription based upon their experience, so kind of this empirical prescribing model. Um, and then they may, my, they'll then send a sample off to a, um, to a central laboratory um, for overnight culturing. Um, and then two days later, the clinician will find out whether or not that prescription was correct or not. And in the meantime, the patient may be suffering. So the, the patient, you know, in that case that you can see there, the patient was having fevers and back pain, um, uh, basically because the, um, because the bug was resistant to the, the antibiotic prescribed. And I think that the key message is there on the bottom left is what, what should have just been a simple doctor's visit becomes a two, three, four week problem. And you also exacerbate the problem of antimicrobial resistance, which as everyone will know is absolutely huge on everyone's radar at the moment. So a few facts and figures about urinary tract infection. Um, absolutely massive numbers, um, 150 million at least worldwide each year. Um, they represent 20% of antibiotics prescribed into the community. They are the largest ordered laboratory test. Um, they're the most common cause for, um, uh, for unplanned admission. So you, the, the case on the left there, you can see very quickly the patient might need to be admitted for some of their symptoms. Um, and um, almost everyone will be touched by it in their lifetime. And some people have recurrent infections. So the long and short of it is um, clinicians need a fast and affordable point of care test to try and, to try and help solve this problem. Um, and, and no good solutions exist, exist yet. So FENUTEST. Um, FENUTEST was spun out of the University of Liverpool uh, this year, so, so very new. Um, it's based on the work of two researchers, Professor Douglas Kell and, and Dr. Srijan Jindal. Um, and they described a method, or they basically discovered a method of um, uh, identifying whether bacteria are growing, static, or dying in the presence of an antimicrobial within 30 minutes. Um, they tested that method on clinical samples, and it's been shown to be 100% sensitive and uh, uh, and also specific. Um, we 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 think we can develop this into a proprietary method and software, which will be between five and ten x cheaper than the existing overnight culture method. And we're looking for around two and a half million of investment to move move forward with the design of our device. Um, so very quickly, I wanted to describe um, what enables our solution because I think it's really important to say why this is the moment that a, uh, a really groundbreaking urinary tract infection test is possible. So there's kind of four elements I'm describing there. One is patented research. So the method that you can look up that, that we've, we've, um, we've published, um, which shows, um, shows how we can uh, see sensitivity of bacteria to antimicrobials uh, in under, under 30 minutes. Second one is computational methods. You know, everyone knows that they're, they're really developed to the stage where you can cut humans out of the equation. Um, third point there is we, we've built a multidisciplinary team. So we've got um, biology, engineering, business, clinical microbiology, and, and primary practice all part of our team. So that means that we can be really targeted on the right solution. Uh, and then the last point is um, the cost of detection equipment, the cost of um, electronics has just reduced so far that we can, um, we can provide a cost-effective solution to, um, to clinicians. Um, very quickly, because I'm conscious of time. So we've, we've raised 300K through Innovate UK to develop a prototype um, uh, and we have support from the University of Liverpool. Um, we're looking for um, around two and a half million investment in order to develop our prototype uh, closer to a commercially available device. And I think that's my five minutes. <laughs> so uh, I'll pause there. Great, thank you, Will, for that uh, excellent and very concise presentation. It's much appreciated, makes my job easier. Um, so I think, as, as, as always, I'll open up and uh, Anna, I'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you for that um, pitch. It was great to see. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about competition, because we have seen other players do this in 15 minutes, for example. Yeah, there's lots of solutions out there. Um, I, I think what I would say is that 
most of the solutions are looking for a positive or negative um, infection test rather than antimicrobial susceptibility. So in 15 minutes, they can probably do whether or not you have an infection. I don't think they can do what, you know, which prescription you therefore need to write. Um, you know, th this problem hasn't been solved yet. If, if it had, the, the solution would be in clinic um, and it's not. Um, so it, it's still green space from our point of view. So there are lots of competing solutions. The, um, the kind of biggest technical uh, kind of competing solution is around uh, sort of PCR type, you know, amplification of uh, genetic material tests. Our test is a completely different method uh, and much more direct and observational. So we're really confident that we can get to commercialization more quickly. Great. Uh, yes, Dan. Hey there, Dan from CMS Ventures. Um, yeah, really great presentation, clear problem uh, and, and clear solution and differentiation between you know not just having a negative test, but also having a uh, having having levels of detail which could really help uh, clinicians. My question um, really focuses around the IP. So and uh, if there are any, so we know that the inventors. Um, does the IP lie within the company itself or um, the organization that they're at and they founded it? Um, and also, just one just one thing on the back of Alice's question, what accurate is the test as compared with PCR? Okay, so um, uh, the test is very accurate. So um, we've tested down to about five times 10 to the four um, concentration of bacteria in urine. And... Uh, the, the threshold for bacteria, bacterial infection is one times 10 to the five. So we've, we've tested basically below the threshold that you need to find a, an, a, an infection in urine. Um, so really confident on sensitivity. Um, your, your question about um, uh, intellectual property. So at the moment, the University of Liverpool retains the intellectual property uh, and we've signed a license agreement with them in exchange for equity in the company. Um, we do have terms that can negotiate that in future and potentially signed the IP into the company um, but we're really happy with the terms that we signed with them they're very supportive and you know we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them so um, so we're very grateful for that support. That's great thank you. Thank you Will. Any, any final questions from the other panelists? Yes Nathan. Hi Will, great presentation. Um, so Will the technology be able to be tested or used at home? Yeah, really good question. So our first, you know, one of the first things that we wanted to do is get out in front of clinicians and talk to them about where this would be used. And just the, the feedback was that there are some patients who um, have so many recurrent infections that they would want these in their own homes. Um, uh, the, the other real target for us is is care homes uh, and, and also um certain pharmacy settings as well you know if you can do a you can walk into a pharmacy and get a get a test in 30 minutes i think that would be um really amazing and with the the raise you're planning will that enable you to do that clinical trial to to validate that for, for home use so the, the the raise will basically enable us to um most of the investment's going to go into engineering of the device you know that's kind of the key thing that we need to do next um but we have a portion which will be for a um, it'll be a study using um, a laboratory in London called Health Services Laboratory. So we'll do a study. It's going to be as big as we can kind of do at this stage. The reason that we then have a, a further fundraise is that, um, you know, clear feedback from clinicians is that they need uh, a big study published somewhere like the BMJ to really validate our device. And, and that will need more investment than two and a half million pounds. Thanks, Will. Great. Thank you, Will. I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. But thank you very much for your time and your excellent presentation. Thank you. We'll go now to our next presenting company, which is DeepMed. Good afternoon. I'll try to uh, share my window. Hi, good afternoon, Emmanuel. Hi. Can you see my screen, my, <clears throat> my window? I, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to show you uh, DeepMed um, here today this afternoon. <clears throat> I'll just uh, control of the presentation. And uh, a suspected cancer diagnosis is a devastating time for the patient and their families. 
marking the start of a journey through a maze of diagnostic procedures, surgery, and decisions about therapy. Cancer services are overloaded, health professionals are stretched, and choice of diagnostic and therapeutic options become more and more complex. The pandemic has just made things worse, we all, we all know that. It is now accepted by most experts that the machine learning can and will play a significant role in improving the efficiency and quality of, of most stages of the cancer patient journey, and that includes histopathology, the immediate focus of uh, deep med. Histopathology is a crucial link in the cancer treatment chain, used for staging and grading tumors and helping to match the best uh, therapy with each patient. Since 2017, DeepMed has raised more than one million pounds by the SPRI program in collaboration with NHS trusts to make the first steps in supporting histopathologists to identify metastasis in lymph nodes and assist with disease staging. Our award-winning machine learning models uh, can save time and improve accuracy, keeping the experts in the driving seat. We now have our first products ready for market introduction, and uh, in the process, DeepMed has developed methodologies, strategies, and intellectual property to extract valuable information from histopathology images. This will allow us to execute our ambitious plan and deliver products that will impact each step of the cancer patient journey in a personalized and precise fashion. <clears throat> Deep, Deep Path Lydia is our first close to see marketing product. Our model scans the images, finds all regions of interest, however well hidden, and presents them to doctors for confirmation. Our validation shows that, so that Lydia uh, helps experts deliver diagnosis in less than half the time and uh, with higher accuracy. DeepMed is forging ahead of the competition by using unsupervised learning with the generative adversarial networks to deliver the first pan-cancer solution, which can be used across all cancer types, increasing at the same time Lydia's total addressable market by fivefold. This gives DeepMed a unique advantage across the competition, which includes some companies with a very strong fundraising track record. In many cases, Companies in the space deliver complementary products at this moment in time, which helps to create a critical mass and accelerate traction for the whole sector. The product is engineered to work with any hardware and to deliver its results within the large scale software platforms that are favored by the large hospitals and users. Lydia has a compelling value proposition for all stakeholders. Uh, and on the other side, its simplicity, its unobstructive method of delivery, and its decision support nature makes it an ideal entry point for AI solutions in clinical workflows, alleviating some of the usual uh, uh, barriers. The business model has strong uh, SaaS elements uh, with all the associated benefits, including very high margins and high customer lifetime value. Sales channel is uh, via system integrators, and local distributors, supported by our expert technical sales team and our strong in-house customer support function. The global uh, total accessible market for Lydia is about half a million pounds, half a billion pounds, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, but cross-selling of our subsequent product is a very strong element of our long-term strategy. For example, our planned recurrence prediction product family on its own has a TAM of, uh, of 1 billion pounds in a market window with expected growth uh, rate of approximately 13%. A key component of our market entry strategy is our close collaboration with system integrators with the capacity to provide end-to-end -end solutions to large strats. For example, uh, we are very close to Fujifilm in the UK having participated in common advertising and promotions to several NHS trusts with considerable success up to now. Other system integrators include Philips, Spectra, Pamamatsu, Leica, etc. The pandemic has accelerated the introduction of uh, digital pathology in the NHS and uh, other major markets like in Europe and in the US. There are currently many trusts in England uh, that bid for installing histopathology infrastructure with AI solutions following right after the main install, the first installation. We are lining up trials with selected trusts, for example, Nottingham University Hospital, as well as smaller size independent pathology labs. Our leadership 
Our leadership team includes individuals with distinguished careers in academic, entrepreneurial, and global corporate positions, and a world-class track record on machine learning applications in biotech and healthcare. Being uh, near revenue, we look for a bridge capital injection of approximately 500K, primarily to support market introduction activities until a multi-million Series A raise, which is planned for uh, early 2022. That will allow us to deliver on our product roadmap and extract value from our know-how while creating high impact solutions and improving outcomes across the patient's journey. Thank you very much and please get in touch for uh, in depth uh, for an in-depth information pack. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. I'll, I'll suggest if you stop sharing your screen now, we'll go back for a few minutes of Q&A. Sure. Uh, at Anna, do you, would you like to start? I'm not sure how to stop sharing my screen. You've well, done it. You've done it. <laughs> okay, Thank good. you, Emmanuel. Thanks, Paul. I hope you forgive this two-part question. This really speaks to my background. Please go ahead. The first, the first one, thank you. The first one is how mature is your algorithm? Because, you know, how many, how many slides, for example, has it been trained on? And the reason I ask, which is the second part of the question, is it's a really competitive, busy space. And there's already FDA approved, um, you know, applications that do this within breast cancer, liver cancer. I think they're called ProAct, one of them as well. So um, how do you differentiate? Uh, there is, uh, patho digital pathology is a very an extremely extensive um, uh, menu of very different uh, applications that uh, pathologists need to sit down and do uh, during their working day. And uh, there is, uh, frankly, there is space for uh, many companies to to um, work together to fill up uh, niches in that uh, in that continuum in that spectrum. Uh, we are uh, focusing on uh, lymph node metastasis detection for several strategic reasons. First of all, NHS asked for this for this uh, for this uh, and funded this uh, this development. The second, it's, it's something it's an application that takes a lot of time from uh, from pathologists on 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 the, on the day on the daily work, and it's not that interesting. It's not adding that much value. Um, so it's a it's a and it's also very simple uh, to. Uh, it, it doesn't measuring anything; just focuses their rotation to a specific point. So it, it takes away a lot of the questions. So uh, we have differentiated in uh, the lymph node metastasis detection by going for a pan cancer model. To our, to our knowledge, this is the only uh, we are the only um, company that are, that are is using this technology to go for a pan cancer solution. That's very important uh, because uh, when you are uh, examining a lymph node which is supposed to be coming from a from a breast tumor you're not entirely sure if the primary cancer was on the breast or, or something else and there is some, uh, there's a hidden metastasis so having a pan cancer model is always going to be preferable at having specific uh, models uh, for for its uh, primary cancer cancer set and um, uh, yes our, our models are working uh, we have 97 um, percent um, um, accuracy and very high specificity as well specific the, the models are, are tuned towards towards accuracy uh, but then that's because uh, pathologists are, can very easily uh, know in a one, one second by glancing at the right area they are they are very quickly will identify pos uh, false positives so they don't mind to have 10 false positives on, on the slide what what is more important is to not miss um, a, 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 a true positive is hope um, and there is we are actually working together with some of our competitors going to to beads and um, covering different uh, different parts of the continuum which is this pathology thank you Emilio. you're welcome we have time for one more one more question Well, if, if, if there's no other questions, maybe a quick one for me. It'd be helpful just to you, you move pretty quickly through the academic, um, you know, background of what you guys are doing and the uh, the funding to date. How have you got into this point? It'd be helpful for me to just sort of understand a little bit more about the background to the company. Yep, uh, we have uh, the uh, our founder, our, our CEO, Costas Vugas. Uh, has been in uh, in AI for uh, for the beginning from for more than ten years. He had some distinguished uh, um, uh, award winning uh, um, uh, in uh, in international competitions. I mean, the, our our uh, breast cancer specific breast cancer algorithm has uh, has been in the top five of uh, of uh, the uh, uh, of one of the main uh, competitions for breast breast cancer pathology. Uh, with being the top company 
uh, out of this, uh, the rest of the more academic groups. Of course, we are building everything uh, under uh, an ISO 13485 system with the, the right uh, regulatory uh, 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 systems as well. Uh, we have taken uh, uh, up to now about 1.3 million in, um, in uh, funding from the SPRI and the I4I uh, programs. And we currently are expecting uh, answers for uh, um, more for an, another million uh, coming from the AI, AI awards, which we might uh, we we might get uh, we will know should know about it by the end of next week. So uh, we are in a good position to continue with development. We need the money mostly to accelerate um, traction to okay. sell our first uh, um, our first few customers. Thank you, Emmanuel. That's You're welcome. That's that's very helpful. I think we'll 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 draw um, the presentation to a close there. We appreciate your taking the time and uh, the uh, the presentation and also answers to the questions. There's um, a, a lot more behind that, and obviously you can have an offline discussion for whoever is interested. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much for your time. So with that, I'll I'll then invite the last presenter uh, uh, for the day, human people, to come into the uh, into the meeting room. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, can good you, afternoon, Jeff. Yeah, we can see and hear you. Super, let me just share my screen then. Great. You guys got that. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Jeff Mon, um, CEO and founder of, of Human People. Um, we're a kind of early detection system, plus, you know, we, we also use um, personalized supplements and um, trying to put a, a little bit of science behind, you know, a market which uh, an awful lot of people reach out for to try to find benefits, but often lacks a lot of uh, clinical evidence. And um, when I say early detection, I mean, you know, when we start talking about preventative um, medicine or health, uh, there's a couple of things we need to do. First of all, is kind of find a way of actually understanding what those subtle symptoms are that lead to ultimately disease further down the road. Um, and that's, that's why, you know, in the UK, it's a massive market, 61% of UK adults currently take supplements. Um, but there's a bit of a problem with that. You know, in our um, kind of lifestyle and health uh, clinics, when we do measurements on these people, 60% um, of them take supplements, only 4% of optimal levels. And, and often these can have big impacts. So by the time they come to the doctor, the GP with anemia, they haven't picked up the fact that they've been deficient in folate or B12 or some of the common supplements um, long before that. Um, so we've really been looking at how, you know, think of it as a, you know, that early warning detector in your car as you start getting a, you know, a flashing light that you've got low pressure in your tire. You know, at that stage, if you can get in there and do something, it can might be quite a small fix that, that you're looking to do rather than trundling along before something comes catastrophic. So that involves kind of diagnostics, um, but actually when it comes to using supplements, clinically high doses, but also, you know, the right dose, it can't be too high, too low. Um, we know that if you're not deficient, it's unlikely it's going to give you any help, but you can cause issues by taking high doses. And just taking a stratified approach, you kind of go, well, this bunch of people with these issues, we give them X. Um, we've shown in our palettes that didn't really work. Um, but it's expensive to go to a specialist clinic, and it can we bring this online to make it easier? Um, and also, can we make it less expensive for people as well? And can we build a platform that allows it to actually scale? So the way we've done that, we've built out an AI questionnaire to medicine hasn't changed, and you know, to define the problem, try to find those early detectors, you know, that sign of inflammation. And that's kind of those early inflammatory markers are our kind of key, what we've built our algorithm around. And so as well as measuring those important uh, nutrient deficiencies, we also measure things like HSCRP, ferritin, do a lipid panel. Um, but we also do genomic risk scoring um, to understand those issues and also a gut test to understand where those issues are. Uh, the real challenge has been how you assimilate all that together. Um, and that's the bit that we've worked on for the last year. And then ultimately supplying somebody with, well, you know, what might actually help me? What do I need? Make it easy for me. So there's obvious things like, you know, the nutrition advice, the physical advice. But to lead to behavior change, often, you know, giving them something simple as a first step, you know, those pack of personalized supplements. And what we find a couple of challenges when we were doing our, our pilots. One was home blood testing. Um, and that's a bit of an issue if you ever tried to use finger prick kits. And so with very low satisfaction rates, um, we actually did a lot of work on this. And we've just completed a 
validation study with the Eurofins here in the UK um, for this TAP2 device, which has um, developed a spin out from MIT in the States. And it's been used at Boston Heart Hospital. Um, and it's this little device that you stick on your arm, you press a button, and it takes your blood. Um, Sadly, we don't have um, exclusivity to this, but that has taken home blood testing into a completely different level. And we're a CQC health and diagnostic registered company as well. The second part has been the robotic packaging. And so how can you actually make this truly bespoke? And so we have a robot in-house that allows us to do that. So you know, it's not just a testing supplements business. Ultimately, what we're about is can we detect that potential issue of ill health in the UK at the moment, healthy life expectancy, that's before you get one chronic disease, is 62, or if you live in Blackpool, 52. So although life expectancy you know, is creeping up there, healthy life expectancy is not. Um, how do you deliver that? Well, digital health is certainly the way to do that. And it's that data set and diagnostics, which you know we've got our early algorithms, which we still have to do more work in validating all of those. Um, so there's a lot of clinical input still going into those, um, but we're getting some fantastic results. And we're also developing a point and click platform where it can be used in B2B platforms for other uses that you can drop in those SNPs or genes plus the clinical issues um, to then also give you further insights, which might then lead you into certain treatment interventions. Um, for our market, you know, it's those kind of, Certainly those people who are more motivated, you know, to stay well and keep well, or possibly in the older years, the people who are starting to feel some of those issues. Um, a lot of simple companies out there will do just a simple questionnaire and go, there you go, and off you go. We're very much not taking that approach. We're trying to take a scientific, proper validated approach to this, literally as you would do um, in, a, in a nutrition clinic. And that's backed up by myself, my co-founder, um, Henry's a, Management consultant, ex management consultant from Bain, um, one of the leading nutritionists in the UK, Christine Karen, who's head of brand at Cafe Nero, and, and Alex, who's a data scientist, previously worked at the Lars Hadron Collider. Uh, we're aiming to get, you know, we launched fully after our pilot um, in the next couple of weeks um, to try to hit those magic thousand numbers to get us close to that 1 million um, annual recurring revenue. One of the things we find that when people retested and could see that their markers were actually improving along with their symptoms, um, it led to a very low churn rate. Um, so what we're looking for at the moment is 800,000, which we've raised a quarter of already. Um, that's to build out that tech development, um, the operations and packaging, um, and some of those key hires to hit that 1 million RR as soon as we possibly can to take us to that Series A raise. Um, our pilot worked extremely well, very high retention rate. Um, we invested over 100,000 raised, um, got another 100,000 in the door at the moment as well. Um, you know, certainly in the previous pandemic, you know, things like vitamin D, people are kind of thinking all these things that I can do to help. But the science out there to allow you to do this properly and safely um, is, is really missing. And you know, we hope to be the people to do that and to solve that issue um, properly. Uh, you know, we've had some kind of unexpected results. You know, the amount of people that have reported back to us, you know, how anxiety has helped. And as we've gone back and looked at that, looking at highly sensitive CRP, which is one of the things we measure, we find that, you know, these dropping down and people's self-reported anxiety levels um, have been dropping as well. So if you'd like to get in touch, my name is Jeff Mullen and um, not open to any questions. Sorry, one second. Um, sorry, I, I can't hear you at the moment of my... Ale, Ale, do you want to go first? Paul, I think you might be on mute. So, yeah, sorry, 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 I was on mute there. Dan, I was saying that uh, I saw your hand first, so we'll start with you and then go to then go to Ale. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, sorry, I couldn't see. Um, hey, so, yeah, good presentation. You know, really understand. I, I can see why you're really adding value. Um, um, okay, so... My question really focuses around, you know, especially you, you, you talked about churn rate, but where I'm really uh, focused on when, when we see an application like this at CMS Ventures is uh, the cost of customer acquisition. So could you speak a little bit more about um, that and 
what are you, what are your customer acquisition strategies and then retention rates beyond the 12 months um is there a maintenance package or is there a scaled down version and yeah can't hear you sorry you're on mute jeff you uh, i think you're on mute <laughs> sorry yeah. Uh, that helps. Um, so, so yeah, look, there's another route to the market. And obviously, we've done a lot of work with Karen, who's, you know, that's her kind of bread and butter. So our first step is we own um, a chain of um, um, healthy and skin clinics. And, you know, the acquisition rate, obviously, through those has been pretty low um, to date. And you know, that's certainly a route that we're going working with nutritionists, um, gyms, also work in the kind of the B2B to C, so to speak, um, and a number of corporate well-being packages. And so that's a slightly different model that we'll be looking at where there is a, a yearly pack which would involve, and it's really important that retesting. So, you know, that would be the DNA, the gut test, and two blood tests during the year um, with probably a different, with a different level of, of nutritional advice um, as well. So those are kind of the two main channels at the moment. Uh, we're also using... Uh, our software can read things like 23andMe. We use Atlas Biomed, who have already got a large platform of DNA and, and, and users already. So they don't need to redo a lot of those tests. So it's also partnering up with those um, companies as well. So you know, overall, the, you know, after the 12 months, it's, it's, what's really important is that re-engagement. And so it's not, you know, there's, there's one stage where you're fixing and then there's maintenance. Um, and then it allows people to go back into um, algorithm and kind of go, well, actually, you know what? You know, my issue at the moment as I get older is, is actually I need more energy or, you know, actually it may be that, you know, I've got severe PMS symptoms I want to fix or skin. So it's trying to make sure we do that. And obviously there's there's more things in the pipeline as well as we've validated it, that the, the testing device, um, looking into hormonal testing, um, looking into well mount testing, et cetera. So we really want to build this out as, as a wider well-being platform. That's great. Thanks for that. Thanks, Dan. Ella, you also had a question. Yeah, thank you. I think I had a similar question to Dan, so thanks for answering that one. The second one that I have, if you don't mind, is if you're moving towards, you know, looking at hormonal, et cetera, et cetera, what's the regulation around that? Are you prescriptive? So depending on what you're doing, so there's certainly regulation with the CQC around that. So as, as I mentioned, we are a registered diagnostic and health screening business. And um, if we move down towards prescribing, then that's something quite different. So you can diagnose and say, right, there's clearly an issue here and signpost in the right direction to particular professionals. We wouldn't be prescribing um, at the moment. It'll be outside our regulatory. If we did want to go down that route, then obviously there is the, the pharmaceutical issues, et cetera, et cetera. Great, and I think uh, last question of the day, Nathan. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, there, there in my work in the precision medicine space, there certainly is companies that work in nutrition and genomics and, and personal data. You, you mentioned kind of looking at hormone testing, um, well men testing. Is there any tests that or advancements that you can see that will keep you ahead of the market? So um, I think when it comes to genomic risk scoring, you know, we're at a place at the moment that is useful as a secondary bit of, of information. Obviously, the epigenetic um, uh, scoring that will add more value to DNA testing. Um, too expensive, really, I think, for commercial use for a lot of people at the moment. I think that will that's really going to be the big opening up. There's more omics tests out there as well that I think will keep you We'll, we'll keep us, you know, right up, you know, at the high end of that curve. So, uh, you know, we've looked at all of those, you know, we'd love to involve them, but commercially, they're, they're not there yet, in my opinion. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for your excellent questions. I think that brings uh, to an end this presentation and our pitch day. So thank you uh, to everybody who pitched, as well as all of the uh, panelists for your excellent questions. I'll now hand back to Giacomo and uh, Perea. Thank you.